later on. Welcome, everybody. This is our updated non-technical introduction to chat GPT. We did one a few weeks ago, just before Microsoft and Google made their announcements. So we thought we'd better update because those announcements have got really important implications. Uh, we'll refer back to the first session uh, during this presentation. The slides are repeated, but we have got you a whole set of new examples. So if you want to refer back to the first one, you can look at the examples in there because they're a different set. Okay, we will start now. We'll attempt to start. The uh, slides aren't, um, let me try this way. That's it. <laughs> That's it, okay. So please put comments and questions in the chat and we'll try to cover some of those in, the, in this half hour session. It'll be hard, we'll be recording for the next half hour. We'll then have a brief discussion, open discussion, if anybody wants to stick around. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves in a minute. We'll talk through a very brief history of the of chat GPT, and then we'll talk about applications and examples. Sue, introduce yourself. So I'm Sue from Sheffield Hallam University. I'm a principal lecturer and learning and teaching lead in the Department of Computing. Okay, and that's me. Uh, I'm now into my third career. I'm now working as an education consultant. I've got particularly interested in chat GPT. Uh, if there's anything on that slide that you'd like to follow up or interested in, please contact me through that email. Okay, we'll get so just straight on. Very brief, yeah, just a very brief in, in, introduction, just um, in case there is anybody that is unsure, because I don't want to make, make assumptions we don't. So just in terms of acronyms, because we're always um, shared with those, artificial intelligence, AI, that, that's what it, what it is. The GPT bit start, stands for gen, Generative Pre-Training Transformer, and Open AI is the organization that has created um, ChatGPT that we're going to talk about today. So what is ChatGPT and who wrote this? Those of you that were here at the last session might know the answer to this, but um, just to save time, it was written by um, ChatGPT itself. So if you've not actually seen this in um, practice, it's um, some, certainly something that I would recommend that you have a go at yourself so you can actually see it in action. We chose not to do it um, live because of technical complications, because it has a habit of um, freezing when you when you do something live like that. So brief history, things have updated very quickly since the last session, which was only, what was it, two weeks ago, three, three weeks ago. Um, but I'm too young to remember Eliza, I'm sure, but Peter can tell you about Eliza. Um, but other people have, you know, been writing about this. And in our next webinar, we've got, um, I can't remember his first name now, Peter Sharples. Mike Sharples. Mike, Mike Sharples. Sharples. Mike Sharples, yes. Who is so, a world expert on this. World absolutely. Expert so has, has already published and, and written um, onto a second book, I think. Uh, there is the free version, but um, it's just coming out recently that there's going to be the pro version, which will be $20 a month. So as with all these technologies, they kind of hook you in with the, the free and you'll get more, better, speedier additional features where with a, a pro version yet to be looked at and of course in the last um, few weeks in fact February the 8th Microsoft and Google made um, announcements about how they're utilizing AI which is going to change the face of absolutely everything for everybody not just people that choose to use chat GPT which um, is just one of many many tools out there Okay, so if you follow that up, uh, what Microsoft announced on February the 8th, well, they've been saying things about AI for some time now, um, and that's a quote from the CEO of Microsoft on that uh, top left-hand side. Every product will have some of the same AI capabilities, and I think some of those are now starting to seep through already. Somebody was talking to me the other day. But the two th things that are particularly uh, accessible now are Bing, which is their new answer engine, which answer engine rather, which is the, the their equivalent or their counterpart to Chat GPT. And we'll show an example of that in a minute. And Edge, so their browser, they've updated their browser, 
and Bing has got is built into that browser. So if you have Edge, make sure you have got the newest version and you can then access Bing. At the moment, it's in a kind of development stage, so everybody might not have access to that. But in a matter of weeks, we will all have access to the new Edge and the new Bing. And you'll see that on the right hand side of that screen, that is the welcome screen that you get. Uh, similar in a, in a way to the welcome screen you get from ChatGPT, um, and you just simply pop your question in and it will produce an answer. And the next slide will tell you, will give you an example of that kind of answer. Uh, and this is uh, illustrates some of the differences between uh, Bing and ChatGPT, because on ChatGPT you get the text answer, but you don't necessarily get references. And you'll see on that, uh, this was a, uh, the question's top right there, what will be the impact of ChatGPT and other language models? So you have a text answer, which is in the middle of the screen there, but for each of the bullet points, you'll see there's a reference. Uh, another difference with uh, Bing and ChatGPT at the moment is you'll see at the, towards the bottom of the screen there, uh, additional questions. So as well as giving you a text answer, it also suggests where you might go next. So for example, how do chat GPT and other language models work? So if you were to click on that, uh, uh, on that button, you would be sent to another text answer. So you can keep going with this. So it has a, uh, you can keep going with chat GPT, but it doesn't spontaneously suggest where you might go next. Next slide, please. There are issues and questions with all these bits of software. And here's an example of a, a, an article we found the other day, a very good article by Sabrina Ortiz. And two extracts from that, one illustrating some of the controversies about Microsoft New Bing and some of, some of the errors that it has made, which they're trying to counter. And on the second side of the screen, on the right-hand side of the screen, is Microsoft's AI chatbot better than ChatGPT? Well, that's a question we'll all be asking ourselves over the next few weeks, months, but the Z ZDNet, which is the source for this article, suggested that actually Bing does seem to have advantages. We will see. And the Google way, of course, uh, this is the contrast from Google. Uh, again, they've, they made this major announcement on February 8th. Uh, they showed off uh, their language model, well, their language model underpins BARD, which is the the AI service that they showed off. Unfortunately, it made a blunder on their first outing, which had kind of financial repercussions for the company, but they will, they will resolve that and sort that out. And there on the left-hand side of the screen is an example from the Google demo. Uh, you'll see the question was uh, about uh, how you might buy an electric guitar and it's, uh, it's an electric car rather, and the pros and cons illustrated there in the kind of text. So again, you ask it a question and it will deliver a text answer. Okay, next. So in addition to ChatGPT, there are a, a variety of different other tools out there. So this is really just to give you a, a little flavor of the things and I'm sure there's more. And if you've come across any, do please share those in the chat. We can add them to the resources and share that with the slide deck later. So Tomi is um, one where it will actually help you create presentation slide decks and, and provide you with um, suggestions for, for backgrounds, et cetera, as well as content and the way that they're designed. Um, Alyssa is a, a called a, a AI research assistant, so it can actually find resources, um, summarize those sources and extract relevant information from those articles, journal articles that is. Um, research Rabbit is um, a similar tool and I'll, I'll show an example of that uh, screenshot in a second. Midjourney creates images from textual descriptions. So you put the text in and then it will create an image for you. And then you can ask it to do it in the style of whatever you want it to, to be. Um, Doll is another one, creates images and arts from description. And Lex is, is with Product Hunt. So it's um, in, in beta, but it's a WordPress processor that's got this language model um, actually embedded in it so if that gets funded that'll be something else out in the market but as i say there may be more if you've got any um examples do share those with us so just to give you a few screenshots this is um on the left hand side i asked it to um create a, a robot looking at a, a laptop in the style of monet 
So that's what I got. And then Research Rabbit, I put in um, one of my papers. And then what it's done there is, as you can see in the um, screenshots, it then says that there's actually 482 pieces of similar work. Um, and then you can look at the authors, you can look at more in depth in the citations, further suggested authors, et cetera. So it's a really nice, rich piece of work if you're actually going to be doing um, a literature review yourself for a paper or, of course, our students for dissertations or any other project that they're wanting to research. And then the one below was created in Blue Willow and... Peter created this one and he wanted something um, that would represent a professor struggling to understand AI language models. So the first thing you can observe there is, is what, what they consider a professor to be. Um, and unsurprisingly, the bias there is that it's um, well middle aged to late <laughs> uh, white male. Um, and, and, and yeah, sounds... so... That sounds like my cue for the next slide, I think, actually, doesn't it, really? Uh, <laughs> um, oops, there back one. Um, just an illustration of the mass media attention that this is getting. Uh, Dan Fitzpatrick, who's a, who worked in, in FE, has uh, produced webinars. He's produced a training course on ChatGPT. And if you see the video clip there on that link, these slides will be available and you can follow up the links and you can see him being uh, talked uh, this being talked about on Good Morning Britain, and I don't think any educational software has received as much attention over the last, uh, well, certainly in my lifetime, as ChatGPT has. Uh, just a couple of things out of the uh, out of the the, the chat. Um, DW, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Just from the from the uh, from that, uh, Microsoft Bing is using version GPT 3.5, that's right, and chat GPT uses GPT 3. So there's a continuous war of generations going on as the software is being continually updated. Uh, and there's a couple of questions about kind of ethics and what have which we'll come back to in a bit. There's a there's a, a selection of quotations. Uh, the ones in black at the top of the screen are the ones we we've had used last time. This uh, uh, that first one is uh, AI won't replace teachers, but it will replace teachers who can't use AI, um, as opposed to expensive deal with the devil, high tech plagiarism. So the, we've selected quotes which show you the variety of opinions that people now have on this or, already. The two at the, in blue at the bottom are from a professor who's encouraging his students to become responsible, and we'll come back to that uh, again a bit later on. And the final quote was from a radio program yesterday, um, the CEO of Century Tech, who are a company that produces lots of uh, online resources for schools, uh, talking about important to differentiate human intelligence and AI, because ChatGPT can regurgitate very, very well. So are we now uh, wanting to, to, to use humans and AI in some sort of collaborative and some sort of cooperative relationship, which uh, certainly I think is probably uh, the, the general way forward. And again, we'll come back to that a bit later on. Sue? So just for the benefit of those that um, perhaps didn't see the last last session, just to, to go over these, um, ChatGPT is, is, is quite clever. Um, it's in terms of grammar, it, there's very, very few, few mistakes um, in there. And the topics that you're looking at, you know, it, it is going to bring things that are relevant. And, you know, in theory, it could even full, full experts that it's been written by somebody else. And we've certainly got plenty of examples of, of that. And, and certainly in terms of providing something that would represent a good assignment. Yes, it can um, provide that. But it's important to note that it doesn't understand and and it can certainly bring together as it pulls all the information um across the i forget how many tetrabytes it is but it's an incredible amount of of data um some of that information could be inaccurate um completely wrong um and certainly there's there's issues around um bias of the information that's collected um it's created so that it will actually sort of estimate the most likely words that would um, follow given the prompts that you, you're giving. And there's certainly some, some learning to do around 
asking the right questions to bring the most appropriate um, information back. And lots of fun have been had to ask it to mimic different styles of um, writing. So mentioned by biases in, in there, um, it's not able to be critically um, evaluating lots of different information. It will present the facts and that's left for somebody else to do that um, from. And the one thing that we have to remember, this current version, the free version that um, people have access to, it's only got data up to 2021. That's when they brought all this together. So when they're going to update it is yet to be um, seen. And that is a key difference between uh, chat GPT and the Microsoft uh, enterprise, because Microsoft, the Bing uh, looks at the internet live. Uh, so it is essentially up to date. Now, what chat GPT, how are they going to respond to that? Well, I, I'm assuming that they will, they will be able to scan the internet live very shortly, but that's a, a particularly important difference at the moment. Yeah. And that's just a comparison of tools. Uh, the conventional internet search, as you get from Google and DuckDuckGo and ChatGPT. Uh, so one, you're ending up with links. In other, you're ending up with text. And of course, there are all sorts of uh, facilities that ChatGPT has, which are at the bottom of that screen, which of course you don't have with conventional Google search. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about examples in just a second. Um, just have a quick look at some of the questions that are coming out of the of the chat. Um, thank you, Dustin. You've mentioned the examples from the workshop from Anna Mills, which actually is on our title slide, one of our title slides, and uh, we'll be including references to that in this in the slide. So anyone who wasn't able to attend that, it's a very good session, uh, will be able to pick it up uh, from the from the slides and the link from the slide. Um, questions about whether the ethical questions, whether we're going to become slaves to AI, and we'll come back to that. We've also thank you, uh, Dustin, for suggesting a collection of sources, and we will be issuing links to that uh, with, with the slides for this. Um, and Vivian asked an interesting question: Is there a way to use this with non-first English speakers? Um, it'll be interesting to see where it goes in terms of uh, language availability uh, in future. But at the moment, it is all in English because people can use it. Um, uh, Non-native speakers can use it. And we've come across examples of that to help with uh, their English by putting uh, text in and asking it to check it for correct grammar. Or So let's move on to the examples. Uh, the examples we used last time are down the left hand, court, the left -hand side of that slide. Uh, but we'll, And they are still available if you want to go back to it. Uh, let's put, look at examples from this time round, and some questions you may like to pose for our examples. Is the text coherent? Can you spot any obvious errors? Anything that could be challenged? How will you describe? Because ChatGPT says it makes natural use of language. Do we agree that it is? And finally, what level, a particularly important question here, what level is ChatGPT working at? Uh, we know that it can generate answers to uh, exam questions or assignment questions, which will pass at certain levels. And that's gone up to MBA level so far in terms of studies that we've seen. But what is the level that it's naturally pitched at and how far can you push it? Um, we shall see. So let's have a look at example one. OK, that so is... we've we've used ChatGPT, haven't we, to help us um, with with these. So one of the interesting things is that you can actually ask it to present an answer in so many words. So this is an example. Uh, we asked it, what can chat, G chat GPT, it's not, doesn't roll off the tongue, does it now? Offer UK <laughs> higher education in 50 or 100 words. So you can have something quite concise. Um, be interesting sort of for abstracts and things, wouldn't it? So that that keeps it um, nice, nice and neat. And then you can then add further questions and you know this is a kind of iterative process as you're looking at it in uh, for any particular topic given topic that you want to research or, or understand you'll ask the next question the next question the next question so um, you can go on to add um, 
how many words again? So we've asked for a little bit more here. What are the negatives of chat GPT in 100 words? And what's the potential downsides to the use of, of chat? And, you know, it, it admits that careful consideration, ethical evaluation should be conducted to mitigate the risks that we've been explaining. So that um, is truthful and, and honest and, and something that needs to be kind of still highlighted to um, to everybody and anybody that uses it. And we obviously asked it about education development units uh, and what, what's the future? Will, will they become more or less influential? Um, and you'll see it offers, if you like, both sides of the coin. Become more influential, yes, which is good news, and will have a key role to play in providing support and guidance to faculty and staff. So all you education developers out there, uh, ChatGPT appears to be on your side. Mm -hmm. um, and we look forward to the, to the future. Next. So this is a question we asked it to answer the question and the style of. Um, so if you want to have a quick look at that, any guesses on what style we asked um, ChatGPT to present that? The, in the first session we did, we asked it to answer the question in the style of Boris Johnson. So you may well wish to refer back to that. So there's a clue that this is a po politician, and I wonder if I haven't seen any response in the chat yet. Would anybody like to um, offer a suggestion? Not Trump. No, there is a, we have got a, we did try it with Trump, and that worked quite well. <laughs> this is talk about in, him. <laughs> uh, American president, closest so far. Um, this was, in fact, in the style of Barack Obama. And I I think there's, there are elements of Obama speak in there, but I'm not sure it's, that's totally convincing. Not but it's something you can play with. And it, you can, uh, you can answer, ask it to answer any question in the style of X. And there was talk Next. as well about in the age of as well. So one of the things mm, is that right. if it's grammatically practically perfect, then, you know, that would be um, something beyond a lot of our students. But, you know, it could be changed to say, you know, do it in the style of somebody of the age of a younger age. We'll see an example of that actually in a minute. Uh, obviously, the really important is what, the, what is the question and or the prompt as they talk about it, uh, because it doesn't have to be a question, it can be just something. Um, refining prompts, and there's apparently a new uh, skill emerging of prompt engineering. Um, and this is advice from ChatGPT itself. We went to the source and we asked it how it uses brackets. Because if you put bracket, a bracketed instruction before a, a question or a comment or a suggestion, then it will respond to that. And it does appear from examples I was looking at last night, that if you tell it, it's, uh, it is, you are an expert mathematician, it will give more accurate answers. Which, and that's an interesting spin on it. But you can look at the examples there. If you put in brackets in the context of, or drawing on scientific research or what have you, you help as, as it says in that, first, that final paragraph, help GPT generate responses more relevant, accurate, and useful. So it's well worth thinking about painting a picture, a context, or a role for chat GPT before you ask it the question. Next. So this particular example, we asked them to uh, chat GPT to summarize the novel 1984 in less than 100 words. So. Anybody's thoughts on, on this one and what um, level of students might have written this? We, while you're thinking about that, we've got a couple of examples, thank you, in the chat of how it can use Russian and translate from Russian into English and then summarise and answer. So there are all sorts of interesting opportunities around languages there uh, because it has translation facilities available to it uh, and we can see that improving dramatically over the next few years but as somebody says in the chat there uh, pretty good already very good already in fact um that, that this so we've got thoughts on the 1984 is it's very undergrad so yeah but uh, would it be a pass undergrad i suspect it would actually but uh, we can come back to that move on this was when we asked it to plan and evaluate. We asked it to produce a summary plan for a research project, uh, less than 100 words. Uh, next slide, you'll see that that's what it said. This is the first part. It gave us a name. It gave us methods, mixed methods, 
quantitative and qualitative. That's pretty good. Yeah, does that seem sensible enough? Uh, next slide, please, Sue. And you'll see it decided to, to identify participants and identify the expected outcomes. So we thought that was a reasonable uh, starter for 10. We then asked it to evaluate. So in terms of its likely success, if it could be in, in completed by undergraduates in less than six months. And we also gave it a time limit in terms of how much time you'd expect the undergraduate to study on it. And this is what it came up with. So it's, uh, it can be challenging apparently this task. See that first paragraph, but it seems feasible. And it says that the aims, methods, participants, et cetera, are okay. So it's, uh, it's uh, giving it the thumbs up for the moment, but part two of the evaluation. And of course, we didn't give any clues as to how and why you evaluate, but this is what it came up with. And it's making some pretty sensible suggestions there, carefully plan, look out for some things that are time consuming, but the overall estimate is that that is, uh, will be, could have the potential to be successful. Um, and obviously you can change the plan, you can change the evaluation, you can give it more specific criteria. That gives us an, uh, an idea of the, of the interesting scale of this kind of uh, application. Next one would be cultural understanding. Uh, using dialects typical of native Scottish Glaswegians in the 1950s, what are the prospects for Scotland to become an independent country? Um, and the answer is as follows. Um, and we think this is quite interesting. It's, we, we have consulted native Glaswegian speakers on this and they can point out there are some really dodgy expressions here in terms of accuracy and relevance. But perhaps most importantly is that if you think of an audience of kind of formal presentation in the 1950s, people would not use uh, Scots dialect because that was not considered appropriate at that time. So in terms of cultural, in terms of technical expertise, it's maybe uh, a wee bit past, but in terms of cultural appropriateness, it is definitely a fail. <laughs> and the next one was uh, again, to explore this idea of how much it knows about the world and culture and et cetera, at society. We asked it to the reactions to GPT to chat GPT in the States as opposed to the UK, and it gave us this answer. It's possible that, and it, you tend to find sort of somewhat uh, hedging bets uh, responses coming out of chat GPT as that first sentence. It's possible that you may have different responses. They say UK, strong emphasis on academic integrity. Further down, uh, USA, there may be a greater emphasis on innovation and the use of technology. So it has identified differences. It has identified plausible differences, but whether, in fact, we would, uh, we could probably spend the rest of this today uh, arguing about how accurate it is. Okay, Sue. So. So just to finish off really thinking about um, how, how can we use it in alternative ways. Um, so the, these are just some suggestions, you know, if you have more suggestions, again, please do share, share them. But as a, as a study aid, you know, as a virtual teaching assistant, you know, if you imagine students, night owls as they tend to be, you know, they can actually reach out to somebody when they're actually doing the work in the middle of the night in prepare, preparation for submitting assignments. Um, people have used it for, grading and, and constructing um, assessment criteria, lesson curriculum planning. Um, there's use in, in um, conjunction with the students giving formative feedback on um, dissertations and projects on, on the structure and the grammar and, and, and um, of different things for dissertations and projects, designing presentations and uh, another tutor has used it, you know, to highlight what are the privacy and safety concerns of, of using such tools. And these are some examples of um, where students have been using it. So again, resources that you can have a look at after the session once we've shared the slides for you. Yeah. Anything you want to pick out from that, Peter? Yeah, particularly well, the, 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 the example we used last time is the link at the top of the page. These are two new examples that came across a few days ago. And in particular, the idea of the medical student on the right, in fact, I think the other student also does this, where they're using ChatGPT to generate cue cards, flashcards for their revision. 
which, uh, which uh, is a really intriguing example. So these are both examples of students who are using it for themselves and are finding it really helpful and really useful. But of course, that's the responsible use of AI. There are all sorts of issues and uh, the next couple of slides will generate, will identify the main issues. Sue? So in all honesty, can we actually identify whether it is AI generated text or not? Um, the, the, there is a number of um, press releases and uh, types of software that might be able to do that, um, but it's not found to be actually 100% um, correct. So we're kind of stuck in, in the middle in terms of that. We certainly need... Um, to be discussing and I'm sure those discussions are going on at this this point you know an institutional strategy and guidance for students and of course staff as well that's going to be um, very important. There are some and, more important issues and implications in terms of how tutors make best use of it, how do we develop critical AI skills and the whole uh, whole set of issues about data security, privacy, ethics uh, and just to go back to the chat uh, thank you, Colette. As a Glaswegian, there's no way that that example would pass. We agree, <laughs> actually. Um, it might just scrape if the tutor was very generous, but it has got all sorts of errors in there. But one of the interesting thoughts, of course, is that you could use, you could generate an example like that to get people to critique how Jack Chat GPT works. Um, so. So there is still more questions than than answers. Um, you know, we're not going to solve it all, all today, unfortunately. But um, the good news is that we do have um, another session coming up on March the 8th, which we hope um, you can attend. And that will be led by um, Mike Sharples, who is um, at least one of the um, renowned leading experts on, on AI in, in relation to its use with within and for education. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in writing and we'd recommend thoroughly his book, which will be in the, which is in the references lists. Um, and one thing we will be also organizing in future is the debate which we were originally going to have today has been postponed for a few weeks and we will let you have information on that as soon as possible. So we shall now stop the recording and we shall open out for any questions, discussion. So if anybody uh, wants to raise their hand and, and chat, or if you'd like to just simply put a question in the uh, 